Today I'm going to cover an aspect of the story of the Champlain Tower South condominium collapse in Surfside, Florida that occurred in June of 2021 from a little different perspective in terms of the details associated with the role of the registered engineer who performed an inspection of the building nearly three years before the building collapsed. Welcome everyone, my name is Casey Jones. I've been a practicing geotechnical engineer for 36 years. On this channel, I cover a variety of geotechnical, civil, and deep foundation testing topics. So let's get into it. But first, a brief recap. The South Tower was a 136 unit residential building that collapsed catastrophically in the middle of the night, again in June 2021, which killed a total of 98 people. This was one of the more deadly structural collapses in US history. The building had 12 stories plus a penthouse and was constructed of reinforced concrete in 1981. In 2018, less than three years prior to the collapse, a structural engineering firm hired by Surfside Condominium Board documented areas of major structural damage and made recommendations for building repairs, which they estimated would cost over $9 million. These repair costs were to be paid by the owners of the units, which was estimated to range from $80,000 to $330,000, depending on the size of the unit. The most important aspects of the recommended repairs from that 2018 letter report had not been performed by the condo board between the time of the consultant's report and the collapse of the building. It was this report which was authored by engineer Frank Morabito, who is the founder and president of Morabito Consultants from Maryland, that I'll address in this video bringing in the details of the report into the context of what might be considered the professional and ethical responsibilities for engineers today on similar projects. The debris from the building collapse and subsequent removal has all been removed off-site and stored in buildings and warehouses to be forensically examined by structural engineers with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, to determine the factors that were involved with the collapse of the building. Their final report is not expected to be issued until 2025, but some preliminary results have recently been released which indicates the building collapse was likely initiated by the failure of the concrete pool deck slab that was above the underground parking structure. There are many people that are upset about the apparent slow pace of the investigation, but NIST representatives indicate it's the most complex investigation that they've ever undertaken. Particularly upsetting to some is that the completion of the NIST report is still two years away, and there are approved plans to build a new 12-story structure at what was once the South Tower location. I don't know whether they've investigated the possibility that there was a geotechnical component to the collapse of this building, say from ground settlement. I can certainly understand the perspective that no building should be constructed at the site until the NIST report has been issued in its final form. That 2018 report that was issued by Borobito Consultants indicated that there were numerous cracks and spalls of the pool deck slab and connecting building columns that was allowing infiltration of water that degraded the concrete strength that allowed the reinforcing steel to corrode. The NIST investigators have indicated preliminarily issues with both the original design and the construction methodologies for this building. I'm really curious to what extent the NIST investigators will address the contents and format of the building condition report that was issued by Morabito Consultants in 2018, if they do so at all. That very question has been raised recently by members of the media. There were reports three years before the collapse and engineers said there were major, there was major structural damage. Did this re preliminary report say anything about that? Why nothing was done sooner to stop this tragedy from happening? Now let's get into the details here. Imagine if you were the engineer who had issued a report prior to a building collapse that specifically mentioned concrete damage of structural building components. What would you have hoped that your report said in retrospect? Well, let's look at this report. I've posted a link to it in the description to this video. The first thing we notice is that the report starts out with a discussion of a minor issue about improperly installed flashing, which was allowing water to infiltrate the units during hurricane winds. Then there is a discussion of cracking and spalling of concrete balconies. At this point, there's no mention of the most important aspects of the building damage and deterioration. Next, there's a discussion about water infiltration through the window panes and indicated that the window systems are near the end of their functional lifespan. Next, there is a description of some cracking of the stucco in the building facade and the lack of proper supports for suspending window washing platforms. Near the bottom of page six in their nine page report, there is a discussion about the concrete damage throughout the pool deck and entrance drive to the parking garage. This is the most noteworthy portion of the report in my opinion at the top of page seven, which says, 
However, the waterproofing below the pool deck and entrance drive, as well as all the planter of waterproofing, is beyond its useful life and therefore must be completely removed and replaced. The failed waterproofing is causing major structural damage to the concrete structural slab below these areas. Failure to replace the waterproofing in the near future will cause the extent of the concrete deterioration to expand exponentially. Also in the report, there's some details presented as to the procedures recommended for implementing these repairs. Then there's a rather pointed criticism of the original building architect for designing a flat rather than camber concrete slab for the pool deck that allowed water to pond on the top of the deck. This water was apparently leading to leaching of the concrete constituents and was causing corrosion of the reinforcing steel. The report concludes by talking about abundant cracking and spalling of varying degrees of the concrete structures in the parking garage. So let's take a bird's eye view of all this. And it reminds me of the old saying about bearing the lead, as they used to say in the newspaper business. As the report did not contain any warnings about observation of major structural damage to the building at the beginning of the letter report. Also, there were no warnings in the report about the potential consequences associated with the observed building problems. There have been media accounts that the residents of the class building had not been told by anyone about concerns of major structural damage to the building. So do you think that this report was merely poorly written? by saving the most important aspects of the observation of major structural damage for the end of the report? Or do you think the letter was written in such a way as to slowly break the bad news of the extensive and disruptive repairs that would be needed to the building? To me, I thought it was interesting that there was no mention of the estimated repairs in the body of the letter report, but apparently was included as an appendix. In the closing paragraph of this report, there's this sentence, MC, is available to further discuss the recommended repair work and how it coincides with the owner's desires and constraints. Now, does this suggest the possibility that the condo association would be constrained in what they could or would spend for repairs? There's no discussion of the life safety aspects of the structural deterioration that was observed, except to note the cracked pool deck pavers do not appear to pose a hazard to the building occupants and were in no need of repair at that time. So presumably a potential tripping hazard. But again, that's the only mention in the report about potential impacts to individuals related to the structural condition of that building. Immediately prior to the catastrophic failure of the building, a tourist took this video of water pouring through the pool deck slab and running into the parking garage, along with pieces of broken concrete, which formed piles of debris on the garage floor. They also reported hearing loud crashing sounds. All indications are that when this floor slab collapsed, the rest of the 13-story building, along with its occupants, came crashing down into a giant heap. So why didn't the engineer make more direct and urgent statements about the implications of the building damage from their observations? The short answer is, I don't know. In my own practice, I've had to deliver bad news to clients that would result in construction delays and expensive repair costs. My style is to present such news candidly and directly at the very beginning of my letter reports, and then I follow up with discussion over the phone or in person. But I clearly document my major concerns to the extent I have any in the letter because that's the deliverable. I've even had instances where I had to threaten to contact government officials if problems that had potential life safety implications had not been rectified. Years ago, I had a project, a bridge project, that uh, it was determined that some of the driven pile were damaged by being driven to hard limestone rock. And uh, the structural engineer involved with the project reportedly wasn't concerned about the damaged pile. And the contractor felt constrained that, you know, hey, this doesn't seem right, but he's the engineer of record and I think we need to move, move along with what they're saying. I said, no, you don't. Those pile need to be removed. And if you don't take them out, I'm gonna have to notify the city. So, you know, that's a more extreme example, but you know, these are things that I feel very strongly about, and it's, it's an obligation professionally and ethically for an engineer to put public safety paramount. It's also worth noting that the condo association who retained more veto consultants for the 2018 study was getting ready to follow up with the required 40-year building recertification. So in essence, this 2018 report was sort of the preliminary version of the work that would be required for this recertification effort. According to the Washington Post, the condo board solicited proposals from several prospective engineering firms, but Morabito Consultants was selected for this recertification study for a reported fee of over $546,000, less than one year before the collapse of the building. In the days after the collapse, there was at least one media outlet who asked the Florida Board of Professional Engineers whether any of the engineers who had been involved with assessing the condition of the building would be investigated by them. The media outlet indicated that the board declined to answer that question. So another thing that jumps out to me about the 2018 report is that there are no discussions about the risks associated with continued occupancy of the building 
except to say that repairs should be done in the near future. It turns out that people are generally poor at making an accurate assessment of risks. Risk is a combination of probability and severity, as we can see from this matrix. A situation can pose a high risk if the resulting consequences are severe, even if the probability is rather low. So by that definition, one would consider that this building was high risk to its occupants given its documentation of major structural damage. However, qualified engineers and building officials are considered to be in the best position to appropriately assess the risk to tenants for continuing to occupy a building with such documented structural damage. I would like to pose the following thought experiment which touches on potential professional and ethical issues. Let's say that this report had been written in a much stronger manner to suggest that the building was no longer fit for occupancy until the necessary repairs had been made. The engineer could have recommended that the occupants be evacuated and that a more extensive and perhaps invasive investigation and monitoring program be implemented. The engineer could have also recommended emergency shoring and stabilization methods to be deployed for the building. Let's say that such recommendations had been made, but the condo board decided to sit on the report and not take any action or disclose the results. At that point, if you were the engineer involved, would you have contacted the local building officials and urged them to evacuate the building? What if you did that and the building officials did nothing except to get assurance from the condo board that they would make repairs at some point while the building remained full of tenants? Do you call a press conference and air your concerns about the life safety issues and risks that you perceive and possibly be sued by clients and tenants for causing what they may perceive to be undue alarm? and a drop in their property values? I raise all these questions because there are situations that are clear cut and what you need to do as an engineer to ensure the safety of the public. But there are also many instances where the complexity of a situation can make it difficult to do what you think is appropriate. I'd be curious as to how many of you encountered either type of scenario involving some ethical challenge. I think that our university system in general does not prepare those graduating with engineering degrees a proper framework for addressing ethical challenges in practice. I think this is because it often takes years of practice before an engineer finds himself facing such situations, and most university professors in engineering have little work experience outside of academia. Engineers are expected to follow their statutory, professional, and ethical obligations to protect the public. To help navigate such situations, it would be advisable to get the support of your team consisting of attorneys, your professional liability insurer, and other qualified engineers to support what you need to do. It has been reported that Morabito Consultants professional liability insurer settled claims associated with the collapse of the South Tower for $16 million. Morabito Consultants made a statement at the time of the settlement last year acknowledging the tragedy, but denied any culpability in the disaster, and they said they agreed to the settlement to help get compensation to the victims' families. As with most catastrophic failures, there appears to be a combination of factors and parties involved that either did not recognize the risks or simply postponed dealing with the building's structural issues. I think an important aspect of this tragedy is that it illustrates the fact that engineers are now accustomed to frequently seeing deterioration of buildings and public infrastructure such as bridges. Currently, a significant number of bridges in the United States have been deemed structurally deficient, yet there continues to be hundreds if not thousands of daily vehicle crossings of these bridges. How many other reinforced concrete residential buildings in South Florida and other places have some aspects of the deterioration that led to the collapse of the Surfside condominium? You know, I think it's uh, interesting that many owners of bridges and buildings rightly focus on exacting high quality standards during the construction phase of a project. Yet when it comes to aging and deteriorating structures, owners become somewhat comfortable in living with high risk situations when such situations would never be permitted as part of the initial construction prior to the structure being put into service. I'm convinced that investigators will determine the cause of the collapse of this residential building. As mentioned previously, preliminary indications point to a combination of design errors, code deficiencies, construction defects, and issues with the operation of the building, along with poor maintenance. My hope is that the NIST report will address not only the cause of the building collapse or causes, but the whys. Some of these whys are how did such conditions occur without the intervention of building officials? Why was the engineering report in 2018 about the issues with the building's poor condition in many areas apparently not raise alarms about the suitability of the building for continued occupancy? Another question, what are the implications about the safety of other residential buildings in the region that were built during the same time period that were also made of reinforced concrete. Now, this won't be in the NIST report, but I wonder why local officials are willing to grant a construction permit to rebuild on the site when the federal and local investigations have not been completed. The city of Surfside has hired a different engineering consultant to look at the collapse and study it, and so far they spent $3 million, and uh, 
the study for Surfside is still ongoing. Well, I hope I gave you all several things to think about relative to the practice of engineering and the responsibility of the owners of major structures. Have you encountered some version of these ethical challenges in your engineering practice? Please let me know your thoughts and please hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons and stay tuned for future videos. Thanks very much.